how to succeed or stepping stones to fame and fortune by orison sweat marden chapter twenty one above rubies the best way to settle the quarrel between capital and labor is by allopathic doses of peter cooperism talmage in the sublimest flights of the soul rectitude is never surmounted love is never outgrown emerson one ruddy drop of manly blood the surging sea outweighs virtue alone outbuilds the pyramids her monuments shall last when egypt's fall young he believed that he was born not for himself but for the whole world lucan wherever man goes to dwell his character goes with him african proverb the spirit of a single mind makes that of multitudes take one direction as roll the waters to the breathing wind byron no say what you have to say in her presence too said king cleomenes of sparta when his visitor anastagoras asked him to send away his little daughter gorgo ten years old knowing how much harder it is to persuade a man to do wrong when his child is at his side so gorgo sat at her father's feet and listened while the stranger offered more and more money if cleomenes would aid him to become king in a neighboring country she did not understand the matter but when she saw her father look troubled and hesitate she took hold of his hand and said papa come away come or this strange man will make you do wrong the king went away with the child and saved himself and his country from dishonor character is power even in a child when grown to womanhood gorgo was married to the hero leonidas one day a messenger brought a tablet sent by a friend who was a prisoner in persia but the closest scrutiny failed to reveal a single word or line on the white waxen surface and the king and all his noblemen concluded that it was sent as a jest let me take it said queen gorgo and after looking it all over she exclaimed there must be some writing underneath the wax they scraped away the wax and found a warning to leonidas from the grecian prisoner saying that xerxes was coming with his immense host to conquer all greece acting on this warning leonidas and the other kings assembled their armies and checked the mighty host of xerxes which is said to have shaken the earth as it marched i fear john knox's prayers more than an army of ten thousand men said mary queen of scotland the man behind the sermon said william m everts is the secret of john hall's power in fact if there is not a man with a character behind it nothing about it is of the slightest consequence thackeray says nature has written a letter of credit upon some men's faces which is honored wherever presented you cannot help trusting such men their very presence gives confidence there is a promise to pay in their very faces which gives confidence and you prefer it to another man's endorsement character is credit in the great monetary panic of eighteen fifty seven a meeting was called of the various bank presidents of new york city when asked what percentage of specie had been drawn during the day some replied fifty per cent some even as high as seventy five per cent but moses taylor of the city bank said 
we had in the bank this morning four hundred thousand dollars this evening four hundred seventy thousand dollars while other banks were badly run the confidence in the city bank under mr taylor's management was such that people had deposited in that institution what they had drawn from other banks character gives confidence there is no such thing as a small country said victor hugo the greatness of a people is no more affected by the number of its inhabitants than the greatness of an individual is measured by his height it is the nature of party in england said john russell to ask the assistance of men of genius but to follow the guidance of men of character a handful of good life says george herbert is worth a bushel of learning i have read emerson says that they who listened to lord chatham felt that there was something finer in the man than anything which he said it has been complained of carlyle that when he has told all his facts about mirabeau they do not justify his estimate of the latter's genius the gracchi agis cleomenes and others of plutarch's heroes do not in the record of facts equal their own fame sir philip sidney and sir walter raleigh are men of great figure and of few deeds we cannot find the smallest part of the personal weight of washington in the narrative of his exploits the authority of the name of schiller is too great for his books this inequality of the reputation to the works or the anecdotes is not accounted for by saying that the reverberation is longer than the thunderclap but something resided in these men which begot an expectation that outran all their performance the largest part of their power was latent this is that which we call character a reserved force which acts directly by presence and without means what others effect by talent or eloquence the man of character accomplishes by some magnetism half his strength he puts not forth his victories are by demonstration of superiority and not by crossing bayonets he conquers because his arrival alters the face of affairs o Eoli, how didst thou know that hercules was a god because answered Eoli, i was content the moment my eyes fell on him when i beheld theseus i desired that i might see him offer battle or at least drive his horses in a chariot race but hercules did not wait for a contest he conquered whether he stood or walked or sat or whatever else he did show me said omar the caliph to amru the warrior the sword with which you have fought so many battles and slain so many infidels ah replied amru the sword without the arm of the master is no sharper nor heavier than the sword of ferezdak the poet so one hundred and fifty pounds of flesh and blood without character is of no great value no man throws away his vote says francis willard when he places it in the ballot box with his conviction behind it the party which elected lincoln in 1860 polled only 7000 votes in 1840 revolutions never go backward and the fanaticisms of today are the victories of tomorrow oh sir we are beaten exclaimed the general in command of sheridan's army retreating before the victorious early no sir replied the indignant sheridan you are beaten 
but this army is not beaten drawing his sword he waved it above his head and pointed it at the pursuing host while his clarion voice rose above the horrid din in a command to charge once more the lines paused turned and with the ocean's mighty swing when heaving to the tempest's wing they hurled them on the foe and the confederate army was wildly routed when the war with france seemed imminent in seventeen ninety eight president adams wrote to george washington then a private citizen in retirement at mount vernon we must have your name if you will permit us to use it there will be more efficacy in it than in many an army character is power when pope paul the fourth heard of the death of calvin he exclaimed with a sigh ah the strength of that proud heretic lay in riches no honors no but nothing could move him from his course holy virgin with two such servants our church would soon be mistress of both worlds eighteen hundred years ago when night closed over the city of pompeii a lady sat in her house nursing her son of ten years of age the child had been ill for some days his form was wasted his little limbs were shrunk and we may imagine with what infinite anxiety she watched every motion of the helpless one whose existence was so dear what did take place we know with an exactness very remarkable that distant mountain which reared its awful head on the shore of the bay vesuvius was troubled that same night with an eruption and threw into the air such clouds of pumice stones that the streets and squares of pompeii became filled and gradually the stones grew higher and higher until they reached the level of the windows there was no chance of escape then by the doors and those who attempted to get away stepped out of their first-floor windows and rushed over the sulphurous stones a short distance only for they were quickly overpowered by the poisonous vapors and fell dead after the stones there fell ashes and after ashes hot water fell in showers which changed the ashes into clay those who ran out of their houses during the fall of stones were utterly consumed while those who waited until the ashes began to fall perished likewise but their bodies were preserved by the ashes and water which fell upon them the pompeian mother we have mentioned opened the window of her house when she thought the fall of stones was over and with the child in her arms took a few hurried steps forward when overpowered by the sulphur she fell forward at which moment the shower of ashes began to fall and quickly buried mother and child the hot water afterward changed into a mold the ashes and the sun baked the fatal clay to such a degree of hardness that it has endured to the present day a short time ago the spot where mother and child lay was found liquid plaster of paris was poured into the mold formed by the bodies and then the mold was broken up leaving the plaster cast whole thus one touching incident in the terrible tragedy of eighteen centuries ago has been preserved for the admiration and respect of posterity the arms and legs of the child showed a contraction and emaciation which could only result from illness of the mother only the right arm was preserved she fell upon the ashes and the remaining portion of her body was consumed but the right hand still clasped the legs of the child on her arm were two gold bracelets 
and on her fingers were two gold rings one set with an emerald the other with a cut amethyst this touching illustration of a mother's love now rests in the museum of the celebrated city i was sitting with grant once says general fisk when a major-general entered dressed in the uniform of his rank who said boys i have a good story to tell you i believe there are no ladies present grant said no but there are gentlemen present mr george w childs in referring to this trait said another great trait of his character was his purity in every way i never heard him express or make an indelicate allusion in any way or shape there is nothing i ever heard that man say that could not be repeated in the presence of women the writer has heard of several incidents illustrating his answer to impure stories on one occasion when grant formed one of a dinner party of american gentlemen in a foreign city conversation drifted into references to questionable affairs when he suddenly rose and said gentlemen please excuse me i will retire when attila flushed with conquest appeared with his barbarian horde before the gates of rome in four fifty two pope leo alone of all the people dared go forth and try to turn his wrath aside a single magistrate followed him the huns were awed by the fearless majesty of the unarmed old man and led him before their chief whose respect was so great that he agreed not to enter the city provided a tribute should be paid to him wellington said that napoleon's presence in the french army was equivalent to forty thousand additional soldiers and richter said of the invincible luther his words were half battles i know of no great men says voltaire except those who have rendered great services to the human race men are measured by what they do not by what they seem or possess francis horner of england was a man of whom sidney smith said that the ten commandments were stamped upon his forehead the valuable and peculiar light in which horner's history is calculated to inspire every right-minded youth is this he died at the age of thirty-eight possessed of greater influence than any other private man and admired beloved trusted and deplored by all except the heartless and the base no greater homage was ever paid in parliament to any deceased member how was this attained by rank he was the son of an edinburgh merchant by wealth neither he nor any of his relatives ever had a superfluous sixpence by office he held but one and that for only a few years of no influence and with very little pay by talents his were not splendid and he had no genius cautious and slow his only ambition was to be right by eloquence 